if you were to ask almost anybody what was the first company in the world to develop a business application, it's unlikely you would have said the answer was Jay Lyons & Co, who were uh, actually the biggest catering company in the world for a while, uh, but known across this country, uh, mostly for their chain of high street tea shops, of which there were 250 at its peak. Um, a lot of them in London. There were, I think there were four alone in Oxford Street. Um, but they're also in Manchester, in Leeds, in, in uh, a number of cities across the north. Um, and also for their uh, posh restaurants, the Trocadero in London, the Cumberland Hotel. They did catering for Buckingham Palace garden parties, for exhibitions at Olympia. Uh, and their watchword really was high quality uh, and, and accessibility, particularly for women, actually. The, the story of uh, lions and its impact on the lives of women, particularly in the 20s when women were jo joining the workforce in large numbers, is another story I don't have time to go into today. Um, but computers, I mean, we, we, we use them for everything now, obviously from watching films to, to tweeting, but I'm going back to a time when the, the possibilities um, that a computer could do anything other than do sums uh, were really just emerging. Um, and, it, and when it was going from a spe specialised instrument only for the mathematically gifted uh, to something which was just um, indispensable to uh, every business and ultimately um, every home. So J Lines & Co was a, a founded towards the end of the 19th century. It spun out of um, a tobacco firm called Salmon & Gluckstein um, and they went into catering as a sideline and got a, a distant cousin called Jay Lyons to put their name to it uh, in case it went pear-shaped and uh, they didn't want any, anything to sully the glorious name of Salmon and Gluckstein, which was known for its cigars and cigarettes, uh, and so they gave the name Lyons. But in fact, it was the Salmons and the Gluckstein's who continued to run the business. Uh, and you might be interested to know that a new book has just come out called Legacy, uh, which is all about that family business, which includes people like Dominic and Nigella Lawson, um, are their descendants of the, of the Salmons, I think it is. Uh, and also George Monbiot, I, I read the other day. I hadn't realised he was descended from that family as well. Um, okay, Halifax Digital seems to be unhappy about something. Um, shall we just close Chrome? Yeah. <laughs> There we are. Um, so it was a family business, uh, and it, as this is a, its shop in Cannon Street. Um, must have been around the shortly after the turn of the 19th, 20th century, um, before they went up to build this huge empire. Um, and they went. They, they, it was a, a very um, uh, a vertically integrated company. Uh, they they had a, a philosophy of extreme control quality control right across the company, and that entailed uh, essentially making everything themselves, from the um, uniforms of the waitresses, who were known as nippies, and they had these very smart black uniforms with pearl buttons that were made in Paris, um, to manufacturing all their own food. So they had, they had a food ma manufacturing business, mostly based in West London, that had a uh, a Swiss roll, roll bakery that made, I, I'm very bad at remembering figures, but miles and miles of Swiss roll every week came out of this automatic uh, bakery and, and bread, and uh, they had their own tea plantations. Um, you, get the, you get the picture. They liked to control everything. But running the tea shops um, was, a, was complicated. Most people would come in and they would have nothing but a, a, a cup of tea and a bun, very small transactions. And you obviously had to keep your margins very, look at your margins very, very carefully to make sure that you stayed in business because if you had too much unsold uh, fresh goods at the end of the day, you would be losing money. Um, if you priced things wrongly, you'd be losing money. Um, and so there was this massive back office function of girls, mostly school leavers, so they would have been 15, 16 year olds, sat at big Brownsvieger calculators, punching in, checking the, the receipts from the shops against the bills uh, that had been issued in the shops. Uh, and there was a manager at the time, so we're now talking about the sort of 1930s. Um, there was a manager at the time called John Simmons. He was one of the few people who was senior in the company who wasn't actually a family member. Uh, and he recalled later looking at this room full of literally hundreds of clerks and, and saying, what a, thinking what a waste of intellectual energy it was. Because 
unlike at a, a, a factory um, production line, you couldn't chat to your neighbour. You had to be totally focused on what you were doing, and, yes, it, and yet it was supremely boring. There was, there was nothing interesting about adding up all these, these numbers. And he thought to himself, wouldn't it be great if we could automate this? But in the 1930s, there was no way of, of doing that. So it was a thought that he simply filed away. Um, so move on till... So, so World War II happened. And one of the things that emerged at the end of World War II was the new, news crossed the Atlantic of something called the electronic brain. And that was ENIAC. Um, and I've temporarily forgotten exactly what that stood for. The last two words were auto, automatic computer. But it was a computer that was developed... Um, at um, Harvard and Princeton, I think it was, to, and essentially used for military calculations. But whereas all the work that had gone in the UK with Colossus for code breaking at Bletchley Park was kept an absolute secret and not communicated at all to the general public, ENIAC was immediately declassified after the war. And so there were all these articles in the paper about the electronic brain and what it could do. So Two Lions managers who were going over there to just have a look at business practice in general asked if they could go and have a look at the computer, and they did. Off they went to see what it could do, and they were immediately thinking, they were already thinking about the possibilities of using it for business um, a, a, across a wide range of functions. And the people they saw at ENIAC said, you need to go to Cambridge, Cambridge, UK, because there a computer called EDSAC, the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, was being built by Morris Wilkes and his colleagues in the mathematical laboratory. So off they go back to Cambridge, go and see Wilkes, and he says, yes, I'm getting on all right, um, but all that's holding me up is, is the money to get on and build this. And so Lyons, the, the board of Lyons, agreed to fund the building of EDSAC on the... Um, uh, in, in return for being allowed to build a copy of the computer and apply it to the business problems of the Lions company. And all this was sealed with a handshake. There was no contract written, nothing at all. But in, in May, um, and, and this is what um, John Simmons said about it here, for the first time there was the possibility of a machine that will be able to cope at almost incredible speed with any variation of clerical procedure. What effect such a machine could have on the semi-repetitive work of the office needs only the slightest effort of the imagination. Imagination absolutely key uh, to, to what was going on here. Um, and on it was in May um, 1949 that the Cambridge people uh, sent a telegram to Lyons to say that they'd got EDSAC to run its first program, which was a table of squares, I believe. Uh, and Leo um, actually had already started recruiting the staff uh, who they would need to develop uh, the Leo project. I keep calling it Leo. I should have said um, it w they, they didn't like the word computer. Uh, a computer at the time meant um, usually a young woman with an adding machine. Um, so they called it the Lions Electronic Office, which made Leo, which, and Leo, you know, it's a lion's name. Uh, it fitted rather nicely with the name of Leon Lyons. And I, I, I really rather enjoy the fact that they had that slightly playful approach at a time when computers were all otherwise called things like PDP and sets of obscure initials. So following the first successful EDSAC program, uh, John Pinkerton was the engineer hired to uh, head the hardware side of things. Um, in addition to copying... Uh, the EDSAC, um, they had to develop their own input and output devices. So what the EDSAC was mostly doing was mathematical work for researchers in Cambridge. Things like x-ray crystallography, um, uh, uh, astrophysics, things where you, you put in a small amount of data, you do a relatively complicated calculation, and you get a small answer out. What the Lions people needed to do was something completely different. They needed to put in enormous amounts of data, do a rather small calculation, a simple calculation, and get enormous amounts of output from it. So all the input and output devices were developed by the, the Lions engineers themselves, um, using things that, that subsequently became very familiar, like um, you know, paper, tape, paper tape drives and printers and, and so on. Uh, and the first business programs 
were written for things like payroll and stock control. So what, what was, what was uh, Ed Sack and, and therefore Leo? Um, so this is, this is Leo 1. Um, these things that look like kitchen cabinets are filled with uh, thermo, thermionic valves. Um, I've forgotten how many there were, um, several thousand, and they got very hot, so the room had to be, had to be kept cool. Uh, and here were all the, the consoles and so on that were used to control it. And under the floor here was the memory. So the, the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, EDSAC, was named because of the storage that it used, uh, which was mercury delay lines. So these were tubes of mercury about that long, about that kind of diameter, in which you could cycle pulses of, um, of, of electronic data, very small not amounts of data in each pulse, but it would, it would whiz around as electrons, get to the end of the mercury, go through that as ultrasound, and then go around again. So you could, you could back up quite a lot of data uh, in, the, in the mercury bit of the circuit before it, it whizzed around once again, and then you could intervene in that circuit to um, perform uh, manipulations. Um, but the, the total bank of mercury delay lines in Leo 1 I think I'm right in saying could store two kilobits of information. That's what we're talking about in terms of, of, uh, of storage. Uh, and they were able to do amazing things with it. Uh, and this is a picture of John Simmons, although it's not actually a picture of John Simmons. I've seen the original of this, um, and it's actually a picture of somebody else standing there in a white coat. John Simmons would never have worn a white coat. He was. He was a manager. He, was, he would wear a suit. Um, and somebody had cut out a picture of John Simmons and stuck his head on, on that picture because they obviously wanted to have him standing next to the computer. But it makes him look as if he's an engineer, and he wasn't an engineer at all. So the world's first routine, time, routine, time-sensitive, office application. That I'm sure you, if you know anything about computer history, you will know that the competition to be the first to do anything is really fierce. And so you have to be very precise about what you're claiming. And what Leo claims is the world's first routine, time-sensitive office application. It was called Bakery Valuations, and it was a program that essentially uh, valued all the ingredients that went into uh, the, the, lion, the operation of the Lions Bakery. And that was successfully run uh, as a, not as a test, but in earnest on the 29th of February 1951. And that, that has been accepted as the world's first uh, business application. Uh, but this, the really serious thing they wanted to get onto was payroll, which was a bit more complicated to do. And um, they had that running by 1954. Um, and, I, and I should mention that all the, all the time, so the committee was running all this time, um, and as well as doing all this work for Lions during the, during the day, at night it was running mathematical programs for the Ministry of Defense. It was calculating um, uh, logistics programs for the railway system. Um, it, it was one of very, very few working computers in the country at the time. And so there was an enormous demand from other companies to come and use it. Um, they were doing pay, once they got payroll going, they were doing payroll for Ford as well, uh, because other people simply didn't have computers. And so they came and, came and used Leo. So its, it's function as a bureau service uh, was important as well as the work it was doing for, for Lions. Um, and so they, need, they, they knew they wanted a second one because they were getting all this bureau work. And somebody at some point said, well, why, why don't we make them to sell? So Lions, the world's biggest catering organization, set up one of Britain's first computer manufacturing companies as a subsidiary, um, which is, again, one of the most unlikely things uh, you could expect to happen. So Leo Computers Limited uh, was formed in 1954 but still as a subsidiary of Lions. Uh, and all the people who had been pioneering the development of these applications for Lions um, went to work for the Leo Computers Company. Um, and so Leo 2 was not very different from Leo 1. It was better in various respects, which I won't go into, but it wasn't all that different. Um, and they built 11 of them uh, and, and sold nine and, and kept the other two themselves. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little film um, I'm, I apologize for the quality of the sound. It's not very good. Um, but it, this is a promotional film that Leo themselves uh, made 
uh, about the Leo computer, and it's about a particular application that really appeals to me, um, called uh, the, the called um, tea shops distribution. Um, and it, the, the film explains. I don't think I need to tell you what tea shops, tea shops distribution did because the film explains. But I, I want you to notice things like virtual online working. On uh, sorry, uh, um, yes, almost online working that that was going on at this very early stage. <laughs> There's a, a lot of interesting social comment you can make about that film. I mean, the the the, the uh, uh, gender division of labour is very obvious. There was one uh, um, a woman called Mary Coombs, who was one of the first women who was trained as a programmer, um, but she remained um, an exception. And uh, there were certainly other countries. Um, I think it was Elliot's who were notable in the number of women they employed. Um, it, and it's interesting because women had been, you know, as I say, the first computers were nearly all women. Um, but somehow when it came to actually developing computer technology, uh, women really had to fight to get into positions of seniority. 
despite the fact that many of them had considerable aptitude um, for the work. But um, Lyons, I'm afraid, wasn't exactly a pioneer in that respect, although Mary Coombs, who's still alive, um, frequently gets wheeled out as an example of an early woman in computing. But as I say, she was exceptional. Um, and all those managers with their pipes was um, much more the, the picture of what was going on at the time. Um, so Leo, two, Leo 3 uh, was the first transistorized Leo machine. So, so Leo was, that, 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 how successful was, was the Leo computer as, as a business? Um, it was very advanced uh, for its time. Every model was advanced at the time it came out. Um, the customers tended to love it, uh, largely because the, um, the, the programmers and the systems developers at, at Leo also worked as, well. they, were, they were actually given the title of consultants. And so whenever a, a system was bought, they would go and spend months with the customer, which might be Dunlop or Ford, a uh, number of different, different uh, big companies bought them. Um, and the consultants would spend time with the company, uh, rather like Anne Digital was talking about earlier, making sure uh, that the, the, the system that they had and the software that they had, there was no off-the-peg software. The software that they had was completely tailored to the needs of that business. Um, and in a way, that, that was part of their downfall, um, that for, for various reasons, one was that quite often uh, the companies these consultants went and worked with liked them so much they hired them, so they were constantly losing their top people uh, to other businesses. Um, uh, the, the other was that it, it just took them out of the company for, for too much time uh, and meant that, and, it, and the time they were spending doing that wasn't properly costed, that was another thing. Um, so managing uh, the, the whole costs of the process of producing these computers uh, was something that Leo wasn't doing um, all that well. Nevertheless, Leo 3, um, as I say, had, had eight times the storage capacity of, of the previous version, ten times the speed, uh, and it, it introduced multi-programming, so you could run more than one program uh, at a time. Um, but the, the, tragically, the, the story came to an end um, because it never, they had never actually made money, and the, 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 you know, the promise that introducing this uh, to take over the clerical work would actually save uh, money on, the, on what was paid to the clerks uh, didn't really pan out. Um, the, the, they weren't able, the, the, the company wasn't able to invest enough to expand production enough. And this was the type where IBM had suddenly woken up. IBM up till this point, or up to the mid-50s, had really been making most of its money out of Hollerith punch card machines and the, selling the, uh, the, the, the cards, the punch cards that Hollerith punch card, card machines used. Um, they woke up to, to the possibilities of uh, electronic computers for uses other than, than defense and, and mathematical use um, towards the end of the 50s and started producing computers in very large quantities to an absolutely standard model. There was none of this uh, tailoring every computer to the needs of the customer. There was a standard model which you either bought or you didn't, uh, and, and lots of people did. Um, and really, given the level of investment, Leo computers couldn't compute with that, compete with that. Um, in 1963, there was uh, what was billed as a, a merger with English Electric, uh, but it was much more of a takeover. Uh, 1964, Lyons sold all the rest of their Leo shares, uh, and the company then became called English Electric Leo Marconi. Um, the, the Lyons people weren't told about this. Um, the, the, sorry, I mean the Leo people were not told about this until after it was a done deal. They felt horribly betrayed. They found themselves second in command to English Electric people at every level in the new company. It was a bitter, bitter disappointment to them all. Uh, but all the Lions people could think about was that they'd got away without actually losing any money in the end. Um, because at, at that time, Lions itself was beginning to be less successful. And again, you'll get all the detail of that. There's a little bit of that in my book, um, which is called a Computer Called Leo. This is why I know about this stuff. I wrote a little book about it. Um, but the man, it was partly the pro a problem of being a family company. You, for, throughout for a century or so, in order to be on the board of Lions, you have to be a member of the Salmon or the Gluckstein family. And you can't always guarantee that the next generation are going to be as bright as the one that's come before. Um, and they weren't. And they started making some horribly bad business decisions. And so the, 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 the catering business wasn't doing as well either. Um, and uh, by 1968, 
None of the British computer companies were doing all that well. They were forced by Tony Benn as Ministry of Technology to merge into a single company, which became ICL, which eventually got bought by Fujitsu. Um, and in 1981, that was the year that last Lions Tea Shop closed, and also that the last Leo computer was retired. And that, that's quite a, a recent date, really. I mean, that's within living memory for most of us. Um, and that, that was one, there were um, a number of Leo 3s that were bought by the post office to run their uh, post office billing, um, premium bonds. Uh, there were national computing centers around the country run by the post office. Uh, and they had Leos and they liked them. And they actually forced um, English Electric Leo Marconi to, to make some more uh, Leos, even after they were supposedly not on offer anymore, um, because they, as one of the managers said to me, we like them, they just worked. They did what we wanted them to do. Um, you can find out more about LEO uh, in various places. Um, the LEO Computer Society works extremely hard to promote the history of LEO, and we have a representative here uh, in the form of John Dale, who will be happy to give you leaflets about LEO later or, and answer any more technical questions you may have. And the Centre for Computing History at Cambridge, um, together with the Leo Computer Society, recently won a big lottery grant uh, to enable them to collect and document and put on public display um, uh, aspects of, of Leo memorabilia. Um, no, that sounds like the wrong word. Bit, bits of Leos, bits of Leo documentation, uh, so to preserve the, the heritage of Leo. Um, uh, that's my book, and uh, I'm told that the bookcase in Hebden Bridge has got two or three copies in, so if you're interested, you can get them there. Um, and there's this other new book, Legacy, that I, I wanted to mention as well. But uh, I think, although I've been talking about something that might seem like ancient history, I think if we, if we think about it, there are lots of lessons here uh, for what could have been done and wasn't, or what could have been done better. Uh, and one thing which I, I didn't mention in passing, but I'll mention now, is, is the role of government. One of the reasons IBM did as well as it did was because they had massive amounts of Department of Defense money, uh, which obviously benefited their defense applications, but it also went into civil computing. The British government was incredibly slow to invest in computing, incredibly slow to see the possibilities, the commercial possibilities of computing, as were on the whole British companies. It was a source of enormous frustration to the Leo people, who really were visionary. And it wasn't, this wasn't a flash in the pan, this computer business. They had been, right from the start, visionary in the way they developed their manufacturing methods, the way they organized their management. And this was just another example of how visionary they were. But they, unfortunately, in terms of British business as a whole, they were rather exceptional. And Brit the British businesses were very slow to see the opportunities uh, of computing. And I think the other message, really, is this, um, this business of how much attention you pay to the needs of the user, which was absolutely fundamental to the Leo philosophy, um, and which I think got lost for quite a long time, but I rather get the sense that it's coming back again, that, that um, the idea that you actually try to find out what your customer wants to do with this technology before you issue them with some piece of kit um, is something that is, is being thought about anew. Um, and certainly I get the feeling that here in Hebden Bridge, the idea that communities can develop these ideas and, and uh, make uh, systems and technologies work better as a result uh, is something that I've certainly found very inspiring here today. Thank you very much. I think that was the last time.